Welcome everyone, we are live. I'm sitting down today in Frankfurt, Germany with Jeremy Alexander Newsom back in the US. What's up, Jeremy? How's it going, man? Great, of course. What, a, what, what an you? amazing time difference between me and you right now. <laughs> it's not that bad. It's yeah. Bad. A couple of hours. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's yeah. It's totally fun. Yeah, it's at 4, 4 p.m. your time, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm 7 a.m. I'm over here in uh, San Diego, California. Oh, okay, so, uh, I thought that's good. So take a few moments to introduce yourself, tell people who you are, what you do, and a little bit of background about yourself. Absolutely. And uh, just apologize for any audio or video issues because I'm outside right now. So if there's a little bit of lagging. Sorry for those who are watching. Um, my name is Jeremy Alexander Newsom, and I've been professionally involved in the U.S. stock market since the age of really 24. Uh, I've been dabbling in the market since I was about 21, um, 18, 21, those three years. I just kind of I liked what I was doing. But for right now, I kind of consider myself an educator. Um, I'm also the manager and an owner of a hedge fund. And uh, my goal is to just teach people how to properly and safely invest in the market. There's a lot of people who truly are mystified by the risks and the math and the movements of the market. And it's my take that it market and trading the market both consistently and profitably is easy, but difficult. Like, uh, like walking a thousand miles, right? Walking in its essence is pretty simple, but walking a thousand miles is difficult. So it just creates that, uh, that discipline, that drive in order to do that. So I guess that's a quick brief introduction of me. Nice, love that. And you were in a previous episode of the podcast on this this Our Street podcast, I think episode one hundred thirteen. If people don't want to watch this back and get a bit of background about yourself and everything, and yeah. so today we want to focus on kind of two things. Two things I want to hear from you. First of all, about kind of routines, what you do on a daily basis. What are these things that make you a better trader? And then kind of the strategies behind this, because a lot of people want to hear strategies, how you trade, what you look for, what's important to think about. So we'll kind of dive into that. And if you guys have any questions below in the chat, we'll make sure to answer your question and help you out, of course. Helpful. Yeah, <laughs> ab absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll be on the chat as well. So if you guys want to chat, uh, I'll be doing my absolute best to help everyone. So hey, Taryn, how's it going? Um, yeah, man. So my, my rituals, wow, that's a very good question. There are tons of, there's tons of books, mentors, programs that always mention you know, how to define your days to define, you know, by defining your ritual, your rituals. And as it relates to trading, um, for me personally, my goal is to focus on a certain select few of stocks or companies that I really like. So I think everyone should have something that they go to, something that they focus on, something that they look at pretty frequently. So for me, um, I trade almost exclusively stocks and options uh, along with cryptocurrencies. And more, more recently, obviously, the cryptocurrencies, but for the last decade or so uh, has been stocks and options. And I do focus on really the same select few stocks almost every single day. They're on my watch list. I'm looking at them. Uh, I review them. So that would be SPY. Uh, you know, that's the ETF that tracks the S&P 500. It's a very liquid instrument, so it allows you to, you can day trade shares, you can day trade options, they have options that expire on Wednesdays, uh, options that expire on Fridays, uh, obviously Apple, so I mean it's the most profitable company in the world, you have to be looking at Apple, but the tech, the tech sector really is going to be changing the future forever, so I mean looking at Facebook, Google, Amazon, Netflix, Micron Technology, uh, a lot of the newer companies like PayPal, Square, Dropbox, these are going to be companies that I do my best to focus on uh, pretty much every single day just to see what they're generally doing. And as it relates to my strategy, um, I do try to keep things as simple and as boring as possible as it relates to the market. So I try to find like where is a good level that people have been buying this in the past, where is a good level that people have been selling this in the past. And I just simply try to do what they've done. So if the stock has come down to that price, I'm going to look to get, I'm going to get in. And if the stock goes up to this price, I'm going to get out. And as far as strategy is concerned, I mean, really support resistance, candlestick analysis, volume. Those are the three things I focus the most attention on 
on any given stock. Nice, cool. And yeah, we had a question about volume a couple of uh, episodes ago when I did live. So can you tell people kind of how that works, why you look at volume and kind of what you want to see? Because this, I, I've tried out myself in the past, look at volume on a chart, but for me, it's hard because I'm not used to it and I don't know what to look for. So yeah. what do you think about when you look at volume? That's a very good question. So I'm gonna try to pull up a recent example. Um, I don't think you're able to see my screen, uh, Etienne. Yeah, but, uh, share if you want. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Um, give me three seconds. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Turning share, share screen. Your entire screen. Whoa. So are you able to? Uh, are you able to see my screen right now? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Wow. Very cool. Okay. So let's just go look at Netflix, for example. Um, so this is again, this is a stock and a, and a company that I'm gonna look at pretty much, you know, very, very frequently. And I'm just gonna zoom back. I'm gonna go back in time a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna go back into here. So this is really when Netflix started uh, just rocking and rolling. And I know that you trade a lot of Forex, Etienne, but uh, and Forex, you don't really have volume. But on a stock, yeah. um, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for huge volume spikes at a very specific location that offers very small, very, very tight risk reward, but also on a company that I like. So for example, Netflix, everyone likes Netflix. Everyone knows how Netflix works. I shouldn't say everyone, but <laughs> I would say the vast majority. Most people, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most people, they use Netflix, they like Netflix, they know how Netflix works. Um, they pay for Netflix. And when it comes to trading, I tell people very frequently, the Warren Buffett, the Warren Buffett strategy and the Warren Buffett approach does work very well. Invest in what you know. So when I'm looking at volume, I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for traders to be wrong, and then I'm looking for traders to be right. And I'm gonna explain what both of those mean in just like 20 seconds. So here's an example on Netflix. Uh, right here. I'm going to do an arrow in just a second. But this is a stock chart of Netflix back in 2015. And I'm looking at this little move right here. So what we'll notice is this volume spike is the largest that Netflix has had, uh, I would just say in recent years at the time. So let's just kind of, I'm going to go back in time and pretend that's what we're looking at present day. All right. So this is speaking of rituals. This is a ritual that I would suggest everyone does, especially if you have trading view, is use yeah. use the use the back trade function. So the back trade function lets you go back in time and trade candle by candle as if you were there right now. Um, that's something that I do at least two to three hours a week. But uh, this is a, a chart of Netflix, and this gap. Yep, this volume right here. So this giant, huge green volume spike is the most volume that it had in about two years, which is a pretty substantial thing to consider. I mean, when you're talking on average, Netflix trades is about 25 million shares average. When you get this huge volume coming in, that's either going to tell you that a lot of people are happy or a lot of people are sad. And if I can look at the chart and I can realize that there is a previous resistance right here on Netflix, so this is a resistance price that has got uh, that held the stock down, you know, here, it held the stock down here, it held the stock down here, it held the stock down here. What happened when the stock was held down is there were literally companies, banks, institutions, let's call them the red traders. They were going bearish um, and they were selling the stock short. So they were selling the stock short. Uh, right here and they made money. They sold the stock short here and they made money. They did it again a third time So you would know for sure they're gonna do it a fourth time. They're gonna do this until it stops working So the question is uh, for a lot of my traders out there If someone is getting into a trade short and you can see on the chart that the stock has failed a certain price numerous times and the only way that's possible is with short selling then if you look at this particular gap, this movement with this kind of volume right here, and you look at the volume, there is an, in, an uh, absolute certainty by looking at the previous few candles. So I'll take this red and I'll kind of zoom in for us. So we can take these previous candles right here, just looking at the, the color of the candle itself. 
is a bearish candle. It's a black candle, which means with a hundred percent certainty that someone somewhere in the world went bearish that day. So this day right here, when it gaps up like that, they are forced to exit the trade. And the only way a short trader can exit the trade is by buying to cover, right? They buy the actual stock. So when you see all of this volume, you'll notice it's a green volume bar. You'll notice all this volume, the biggest volume that's had in two years on a gap that is trapping people and causing the bearish traders to lose money. This is a phenomenal opportunity to get in bullish, right? To go long the shares. And it's a very easy situation because again, it's Netflix, right? You know how they make money. You love the company. So like this is a phenomenal time to buy some shares, even if it's 10 shares of Netflix, it's almost irrelevant how many you're buying because you can make as much or as little money as you want to in this, in this situation. So if I go and kind of exit the back trading for a second, and what I'll do is I'm going to pull up the other, the other volume that I was looking at. So this volume over here, um, right here, this is also the big, one of the biggest volume spikes that, uh, that Netflix has had in quite some time. So this volume spike that you're dealing with, you have this, this beautiful high wave candle. So you have a very, very, very small candle, but huge volume. I really like when that occurs. Um, so you have this really big volume spike. You have this very, very small candle. You know, your entry is here and your stop is here. And based on this volume bar alone, you just have this massive, massive opportunity. And you can see, right, that this is occurring at a place that has bounced before. Right. This is not this is not a brand new. We've never been here before. What, it, what an uncharted territory. I and mean, this is the fifth time that it's happened. So when you have that amount of volume with that small of a candle at a location like that, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal place to get in bullish. Nice. Love that. Pretty, pretty clear to to understand. Love this. Yeah. And so this is on a let me just go back here. So this is on a uh, daily chart. So would you do the same on the lower time frame, like a one hour chart or a five minute chart, or would that be different? Beautiful question. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, so I'm gonna do that again. I'm gonna go into a screen share. Uh, let me see how I click on this. All right, I'm gonna do a screen share. I'm gonna go into a five minute chart again on a stock from today uh, and just see if I can find an example. So this is um, a, a, a company called Applied Opto Electronics. So what I'm noticing is um, yesterday, so yesterday being Friday, you had a white candle. So again, I can look at this candle with 100% certainty and say that someone somewhere in the world bought the stock that day, right, on Friday. So today at open, they're losing money. In fact, the last five days of traders are losing money because the stock is opening below all of those candles. So it's, it's a, a mathematical certainty that someone in the world is losing money today and they're gonna be selling, they're gonna be panicking, they're gonna be losing, they're gonna be upset. So I'm gonna come in here on the five minute chart and what you're gonna notice, Etienne, is something very, very interesting. So this candle right here, this is the first five minute candle, it has a lot of bullish volume, right? So with that bullish volume coming in, what happens is that means that there are people buying. So on the daily chart, what I do is I'm analyzing what type of gap is occurring. Because um, as many of you likely know, I day trade every single day, full time. This is, this is my, my main job, is to, to trade and to look at the market and to find people who are trapped, who are losing money, who are scared, and short term, take advantage of that quick move in the stock. and with the amount of bullish volume that came in here, the entry that we did um, was very, very simple. It was just entering below the low of this bullish candle with a stop above the high. And that got triggered um, about nine minutes into market open. And so when you have all that bullish volume, again, this is on the five minute chart, you have all of this volume coming in, you know that people are buying that, volume, buying that candle because it is a bullish candle. So if I really, really zoom in, You'll see that it's a bullish candle. The first five minutes is a bullish candle. People are buying, and then within another five minutes, they begin to lose money. They're trapped, and they they begin to sell. 
And as they sell, the stock goes lower and that gives you an opportunity to make money on the downside. Mm -hmm. So with the question that I'm pretty sure people are going to have this question, which is why would you sell on a bullish volume? Does that mean that you're kind of going against what most people are going to do? Yes, exactly. So it's a very good question. Most traders, uh, day traders especially, usually are what's referred to as contrarian. So if I see a lot of bullish volume um, and I'm looking at the daily chart and I'm noticing that there's a lot of people who are trapped and losing money, when I start zooming into that five minute chart, I'm looking for buyers to continue to be wrong. Right. They're buying like, oh, this is a second dip. I get it at even a cheaper price. I'm so smart. And then as those levels start breaking down, the fear and the panic start setting in. And for a day trader, I'm just looking to capture those small inefficiencies on a long term scale. Like on Netflix, uh, I'm, you're absolutely correct. I'm looking to go with the trend. Um, and on a shorter term time frame, I'm usually looking to go against the trend. Nice. Perfect. Wonderful. So yeah. we have a bunch of people who just joined us live. And if you guys join me us live, I'm in the chat as always. And if you have any questions for Jeremy or I, comment like also in the chat. If you're watching the replay, comment in the chat too, for sure. And <laughs> Jeremy is really active in the chat. Love it. Perfect. So we have Alejandro and Stevie. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Now, with that being said, how would you take profit based on the two, on those two different scenarios? Would you have one different technique for the daily chart and a different one for the five minute chart? Absolutely, yes. Very, very good question. So a daily chart or even a weekly time frame. So let me go look at the weekly chart for a moment. I'm going to go pull up the SPY. Um, this is the, again the ETF that tracks the S and P 500, which is Many people will refer to as the barometer of the U.S. economy, and I'm going to go to um, I'm going to go to a weekly time frame. So this weekly chart, um, what we're so noticing. To, oh, yep, yep. Yep, share screen. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to share my screen again. My bad. All right. Let me get the screen share. Give me about three seconds. It just takes a little to get that menu pulled up. Okay. Perfect. I'm sharing my screen again. Um, so what I'm going to do is, so here's the SPY. So this is, again, the ETF that tracks, you know, the S&P, the Standard & Poor's 500, kind of the broader market. But what you're going to notice is right here, this is actually a gap um, on a weekly chart, which means that you're, you're gapping from Friday to Monday. Now, what's even stronger than that is if I go to a monthly chart, we're going to notice also a, a small gap from the close of the month of May to the open of the month of June. The reason I'm bringing this up is because this is an incredible, incredible uh, indicator, if you will, on the screen, but I'm not using an indicator, I'm just using candlesticks, that we gapped on a daily, weekly, and monthly chart says to me, um, especially looking at this particular chart, since the trend is overall bullish, that there's no reason for us to stop right now. It's very, very similar, in my opinion, to this gap that occurred back in 2016, which was a gap on a monthly, weekly, and daily. Uh, and that occurred after a correction. So we did get a correction in the US market um, in February, right? It was 100% a correction, but it was a pullback. It was about a 15% pullback, which was very, very healthy, needed, and it makes tons of sense. So to answer your question about taking profits, uh, it is my theory, in my opinion, I'll stop sharing my screen here for a second, it's my theory, in my opinion, that most traders are going to have three main time frames. And those main time frames are very, very short term, right? So we're trying to generate cash flow. So that would be day trading, scalping, the five minute, the 15 minute. What you're looking to do is simply make more money than you lose. So the best way to describe that for me would be I look to lose 1% if I'm wrong. And I look to make more than 1% if I'm right. So I try to lose 1% or less, and I try to make 1% or more. So usually, my, my normal targets are 2%. So if I have a 50-50 win-loss ratio, uh, that means over the course of 20 trades, I'm going to lose on 10, win on 10. But if I lose 1% for every 2% that I win, I'm going to be profitable. So that's the shorter term time frame. Um, that's very similar with a little bit of the... the Second time frame would be like what most people refer to as swing trading. So you're normally going to be in a trade for days to usually weeks. 
Um, and then, of course, same instance for that. I'm looking to risk 1%. And then my goal, obviously, is to get 3 4 or 5% in return. So I'm going to be in that trade a little bit longer, right? The third time frame, in my opinion, one of the most important and underlooked is the investing time frame. This is the time frame where you're not really looking to take profits necessarily. This is the time frame where you're looking to own the company. <laughs> and what I mean by that is you're looking to buy shares of this company and accumulate wealth over your career and over your lifespan. So for example, a lot of traders, their biggest challenge is a mental hurdle when they're looking to invest is because they think I don't have enough money to invest. So for example, they're like, oh, you know, I only make $800 a week. I don't have enough money to invest. Well, the thing is, if you had taken $80 a paycheck for 10 paychecks and used that to buy Netflix two and a half years ago, right? So if you had invested 800 bucks, just $800 into Netflix three years ago, it'd be worth approximately $2,400 right now. 2400 So, I mean, you've you got a 300% return on a company that you love and you know and you use. And then now that you have those shares, it's going to slowly start compounding, right? Because you could, if you sold that 2400 and you buy it back when it's cheaper, it just slowly starts to build. And that's the, the thing is a lot of traders are, are afraid of investing because they don't know what companies to invest in or they don't know how long to be in the trade. That is the easiest time frame, in my opinion because you are still going to risk a percentage. Normally it's a bigger percent. So if you get into a company, let's say it's Johnson and Johnson, just for example, and you're like, all right, I want to lose 5%. I'm going to risk 5% of whatever my, my portfolio investment risk is on this trade. Your goal is to hold that for a long time because that's what makes you wealthy, right? You have to make money while you sleep. That's the only way to become truly wealthy. And in order to do that, you have to have a lot of shares of a company. It just takes time. It takes a lot of time. Yeah, I love it. And it, uh, kind of because this is not only about trading, it's about more than that. It's about build, pretty much building wealth and investing part of it, trading part of it, which is really kind of some, something people don't talk about most of the time, which is great to hear. Love yeah. That. Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. I mean, uh, the thing is, and I would simply say the, the biggest challenge is a lot of people do make trading only about trading. They make trading as a, a, yeah. a, ma a way to make money. But the thing is, is like if you are trading, you're in one of the most, you're, you're in the most incredible market and mindset of the world. There is nothing like the stock market on the planet. Real estate, business, there's nothing like the, I mean, you can make money in minutes, right? With pressing a button. <laughs> so... That's that's mind boggling. And with the, with that opportunity that you have, you have to take advantage of that cash flow that you're making and put it into something that's building you true wealth long term. Because that's I think most traders, their goal is to become wealthy or to become financially independent. And the only way to achieve true financial freedom is to, number one, make more money than you lose. Uh, and number two, make money while you sleep because there's only 24 hours in the day. So if you are, if you're tr day trading, you're not making money while you sleep. So you have to ask the question, how do I do that? How do I make money while I sleep? And that's that the long-term investing approach is just something that every trader without question has to be doing. Perfect. Love that. And how do you manage this when you travel to different places? You still trade every day at this the, like time what you would trade normally or how does that work? Yeah, man, that's a very good question. It is, it is difficult because like yeah. you, I like to consider myself a little bit of a, a jet setter. Um, that was something that when I worked, you know, the nine to five cubicle job um, at an insurance company that uh, I wanted to travel more and I only got one week off of vacation a year, like one week. And I mean, there's so many places there are so many places in the world worth visiting. Uh, I just wanted to travel. Yeah. So for me, um, I honestly, man, I just do it. I just make myself do it because I wake up at market open regardless of where I'm at in the world. Um, the one of the hardest places to trade is Australia. If you're trading the U.S. markets, because the U.S. markets usually open about 1130 at night. 
it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's opening 1130 at night. So, I mean, you've got to either, you know, stay awake all night and sleep some during the day or you're pulling long days and long nights and you're not getting that much sleep, which obviously um, health is wealth. So I always encourage people to get their sleep. Uh, Hawaii is also pretty challenging. Yeah, that's a pretty tough one. Yeah. Also. Yeah, Hawaii is challenging because the market opens at 3.30 a.m. So it's like, okay, I have one of two choices. I'm going to bed at 7 p.m. or I'm, again, staying up all night and sleep during the day. So for me, in those situations, man, I just force my body. I, I just force my body to stay up until a certain time. I go to sleep at a good time and I try to get it, at least six to seven hours of sleep so that I wake up before market open and trade. Um, and that's just a commitment that any entrepreneur is going to do. If you're a business owner, I mean, you ha you're going to have clients in different time zones, different time frames. Uh, you're going to have to wake up and do phone calls and things like that. It's just, it, it's the beautiful part of the world that that's you know, the sun, right? It, uh, we're, we're spinning around it. So <laughs> you got to just go with it, man. Great question. Yeah. And I guess if you like what you do also, that kind of helps to wake up. Like if you were to go at the day job at 3 a.m., I'm not sure you would do it pretty far. But Yep, 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 yep. No, I mean, it helps because you don't have to leave the house, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I would tell traders, this is going to sound blasphemous, but I would say do your absolute best to not get addicted to coffee or caffeine in order to wake up. Um, people, it's, it's a myth, man. It's a myth because, I mean, if you're in the military, um, and you know, you're on a four day, you know, excursion or whatever the case is. I mean, you're not, you're not going to take coffee and to wake up if you don't have it available. You just have to wake up and be alert. Everything you need. And this is a book that was one of the big, the big eye openers for me was the uh, Tony Robbins book, Awake the Sleeping Giant or uh, Unleash the Power Within. It's like everything you need, all the energy, all the motivation, all of the drive, all the grit, the discipline, the consistency is all inside of you. Your brain can truly do anything that you want, anything. It can keep you awake for days. It can keep you asleep for days. It can turn off all the pain in your body. I mean, like when someone goes into shock, when they break your leg or something, it can, it can just totally eradicate all, all senses of pain for a few minutes. And that's what anesthesiologists do is they just mimic the pain receptors and they do exactly what the brain does, but for longer. So me personally, I mean, like you mentioned morning rituals. Um, I mean, I wake up, I don't drink coffee. I have a, I have a good breakfast. I drink a lot of water and I try to either read something, listen to something or watch something that makes me a little bit motivated. It could be Will Smith video, Tony Robbins, Les Brown, uh, Simon Sinek. I mean, you know, Elon Musk, it, that whole list, right? Go into YouTube, just type in motivation, watch mm. something for 20 minutes while you're getting up. Um, I do check emails just to make sure nothing crazy is going on. Um, and then I just start trading. Like I go and look at what the market's doing, look at what's moving, uh, and uh, just get my trade on. And then after that, I'll, slow, I'll slowly start working myself. Once I'm in a trade, there's nothing else for me to do. So I'll usually bust out a workout of some kind uh, in the morning. Mm -hmm. So when you trade, do you, are you kind of, kind of focusing only on trading or do you, do you do other things at the same time? Like do you watch um, know, videos or whatever do do other work at the same time oh man that's a great question so i'm i'm definitely diametrically opposed to most people there's a lot of people that say that uh that yeah you have to be watching and focus on the um on this on the trade the entire time all right that's all you're doing you're taking the trade and you should do nothing else for me um once i get into a trade i usually just set a stop and i'll walk away um, or do something else for about 25 minutes because as it stands right now, automated trading, is very easy to do. Uh, in most brokers, you can set up an automated trade. No problem, right? Where you have an entry, you have a stop, you have a target. It'll trigger either one while you're totally away from the computer. So it's like, let the computer do the work for you because it's at that point, it's all about time efficiency. You have 24 hours in a day get it done, whatever that is. And so for me, yeah, man, if I'm in a trade, I, once I'm in, I walk away, I start doing emails, phone calls, um, you know, interviews if I need, you know, if, if the time's calling for it, uh, reaching out to other mentors, watching videos, working out, doing the dishes, laundry, you know, random chores, 
whatever I need to do, reading a book, eating, whatever it is, I usually actually do it while there's a trade on because once I'm in a trade, there's nothing I can do for a certain period of time. And usually that period of time is about 25 minutes for me. So I have like 25 minute blocks, right? And so once that 25 minutes is over, I'll go back, I'll check it, see if I need to move anything. And then once I move it, like if I move a stop, then I'll go back for another 25 minutes to go accomplish something else. Uh -huh. right. So that means that you don't, uh, so you only enter one trade at a time, basically. Ah, very good question. Um, so that to me is all about risk. And that's all trading comes down to, man. So I mentioned a, a lot of traders, a lot of investors, they want to they, they want to trade because they want to make money. Uh, and unfortunately, that's the exact opposite of what you should trade for. <laughs> you should trade to acquire True. skill. You should trade to become a master in an unmasterless environment. So uh, simply meaning like the ocean, right? The, no one, no human is ever going to tame the ocean, but you can go in and have fun while you're there at the ocean, right? You can surf, you can play in the waves, but the ocean will master you if you're there long enough. So for me, it's the stock market is the very same way as I'm only focused on risk. How much money am I going to lose? I'll tell you right now, from, from me to you, my friend, anyone else who's watching this, if, they're, if a trader is only focused on the money and they're only focused on the profits, they're not making that much. Uh, they're not, they're not going to have that much because at some point they will take a trade and they're only going to focus on the profits and they're going to blow up big. You want to focus on, you want to work with mentors or coaches or educators who focus on risk, who instead of showing you, hey, this is a really cool Ferrari that you can buy with how much money you can make, you want the person that can show you, hey, here's how you can buy that exact same Ferrari for cheaper, less, more effectively, more efficiently, and use your cash on cash to pay for it rather than you know, spending all of your cash on buying the car. It's about, it's about controlling risk. So for me, to answer your question, uh, I can be in as many trades as I want as long as I can't lose on any of them. So for uh, two trades is my max I can be in uh, because each one of those trades that I mentioned earlier, I have 1% of risk, right? So if I'm in two trades at once and all of the risk is on the table, that means I'm risking 2% to make 4%. So if I can take those 2% risk and make them zero by moving my stops or whatever the case is, then I can easily go get into another trade. And I can, get, I can be in up to five trades um, at once if the risk is mitigated. And if the risk is mitigated, I can be in 100 trades. If, I, if there's no chance, I can lose on any of them. Nice. That, that's a really good lesson. I think that's really useful. And yeah, I'm pretty sure people get value from that. We'll take your question, guys, in a few minutes. If you have if you have any question, comment below in the chat, and we'll make sure to answer your question to Jeremy on any topic you want, trading, uh, life, or productivity, whatever, because he's really good at a lot of stuff. So that's gonna be awesome. And then, yeah, I think we'll go with the question right away. So we had a question from Gregory here that just came in. How come volume is more important for upward breakout than downward breakdown? Very good question. So I'll just answer Gregory as well in the chat, but I'm answer for those who are watching this video. Um, so Greg, you know, as you mentioned, Etienne, he's saying, how come volume is more important for upward than downward breakdowns? Um, the reason the volume is more important for upward breakups uh, is because the markets are supposed to go higher. I know this sounds crazy, but that's just economies of scale. That is math. That is exponential volume. That is uh, compounding interest. That is all of that. Um, you're you, you're going to want to. Uh, understand that most stocks, most markets, most companies are supposed to grow. And the reason that the breakdowns, the reason the volume is more important for the bullish breakups is because this is, a, this is showing that the trend is going to be continuing. For a bearish volume breakdown, a lot of people actually flip it, meaning they want to see a lot of volume when the stock is going higher. For me, I want to see a lot of volume when the stock is high that tells me that the, the stock is actually probably going to start coming down because the, the common misconception, uh, one of the tenets of Dow theory is vol volume must confirm a trend. Here's the biggest challenge, man. The word confirmation, when you're talking about a trend, once a trend is established, that is the trend until it changes. So we're in a bullish market right now. Simple as that. 
If anyone tells you anything otherwise, they're incorrect. They're wrong and they're mistaken. We, we are in a bullish trend. We're in a bullish market. And that has been confirmed. That has been the absolute without question case since about 2010. And so you're talking eight years of being in a bullish market when everyone's saying, oh, we're in a bubble. The market's going to pop. The market's going to roll over. The market's going to stop. It's like until it happens, we're still in a bullish market. And everyone wants to be the person to call the top. Everyone wants to be the person to, uh, you know, to be the hero that says this is when the market stops. Volume is all about how many people are panicking or how many people are excited. So, for example, right now, I'll go back to share my screen and just to say, I'm, I'm going to share my screen and, and kind of give you an example uh, of the overall market and kind of what I'm referring to. Um, all right, I'm going to share my screen again. So if we're talking if we're talking about the SPY, I'm going to go on a weekly chart. So the reason that a lot of people mentioned actually very recently that the US stock market was going to collapse is because of all of this volume right here that came in. Um, and they're saying, okay, this is the bearish volume. This is the top of the market. We're never going to go higher. This is all of the people selling. And they'll also mention that as this trend is going up, the bullish volume is going down, All right? They're going to notice those, those two things. Even though both of those things are true, the challenge with that is once a trend is established, the volume does not have to continually increase, right? So when, once the trend is already established, the volume doesn't have to do anything. It just continues to slowly climb. So you want to see the highest volume um, in, in a trend change so this was 2010, uh, sorry, this is 2011, this is 2010, and you'll notice the volume starts increasing. So once the volume starts increasing at about this 2010 area, uh, that is when the bullish trend was reconfirmed after we make these higher lows. So we're in bullish at that point. So until, honestly, until that this market starts making lower lows and lower highs consistently and continually, um, and then the volume increases uh, dramatically. So if the stock does something like this and the SPY goes up to like 310 and you start seeing huge volume spikes, volume spikes that look like this, but in an upward trend, that's when you can be a little bit concerned because that's a lot of people beginning to sell, right? Um, when you are in an upward trend, huge amounts of volume uh, at the top of a top of a trend change is usually an indication of what's called exhaustion volume. And that's oftentimes when uh, a stock gets exhausted, people begin to sell. Um, so I, I don't know if I, if that was exactly answer your question, Greg, I hope it was, but that is kind of my thesis on volume and, and confirmation of trends. Yeah, super useful. Now I want you to take a few seconds to, to talk about the open house you're having for your trading room. Something pretty yeah. cool and people get access for free. So that's super awesome. So just tell people what it's about and we'll get back to the question right after. Oh, thank you, man. Yes, I appreciate that. So next week, uh, starting June 18th, so it's going from June 18th to June 22nd, uh, we're having an open house uh, at Real Life Trading. So I only this is something I only do two times a year. So it's biannual. Um, I'll go to my website really quickly. So reallifetrading.com and at the very, very front of the page, uh, you'll notice free trading room, free week, June 18th through the 22nd. There's many traders who oftentimes simply want a really good experience. And that's why people like you and they love your podcast is because you do, you ask great questions. You're very charismatic. You truly care about the markets. You care about people and you offer great content. In the trading rooms, what most traders are frustrated by is they very rarely get the time or the opportunity to ask questions to the instructor. They very rarely get their questions asked. Most of the time, they don't know what's going on. So for me, when I was in trading rooms, you know, five, seven, 10 years ago, I had, and even today, like right now, knowing as much as I know, there are still often times where I'll go into a trading room just to kind of scope it out, and I'll have no idea what the instructor is doing. I don't know where they're getting in, why they're getting in, where they're getting in, when they get out, what, what they got into. They just say, hey, I'm in the trade and no one knows what's going on. So I tried to create a trading room where I decided um, and discussed very poignantly and specifically why we're, what we're trading, why we're trading it, where we're getting in, where we're getting out, how long we're gonna be in, and give as much information as we can. 
So bottom line, I do it twice a year because we do trade for a living. And there's, <laughs> there are a lot of questions that come in during that week, which is fantastic. But if I did that every single month, um, it would really become overwhelming and almost distracting to the traders who are in the room to, to, to constantly make money and, and consistently make money every month. So if you want to hop in, feel free to. We're going to do day trading room, swing trading room. I'll be talking about day trading weekly options. I'll be, I'll be discussing trends. We'll be actually doing real life trade setups. So if it's something you guys are interested in, just feel free to hop over. Nice, nice. And the link's going to be below in the description of the video. So if you guys want to check it out, that's there. Or you can go on reallifetrading.com as well. Pretty much the same thing. Yes, Perfect. yes. Appreciate it, man. Love Thank that. you. Do you would like to mention or any maybe big pitfall that you see a student make that they should try to avoid? Oh, yeah. Let's talk pitfalls, man. So you're mentioning biggest pitfalls. Um, one of the biggest pitfalls traders make is trying to make money too quickly. It's as simple as that. They just try to make money too fast. Uh, they don't. Under, they don't go into the market asking about risk, as I mentioned earlier. They go into the market just trying to focus on the profits. Now, all they see is green, right? And they don't know how to properly mitigate risk. They, they don't truly understand it. And with that, that pitfall comes the pitfall of trying, it to, trying to do it too quickly. So not only do they want to make money, I mean, everyone, everyone wants to make money, right? So that's I'll put it to you this way. If you want to make a lot of money quickly, you're in the same camp as everyone else. So you have to ask yourself, if I'm trading, if I'm going to be successfully and profitably trading, you obviously have to do something that the majority of people do not do. Because if the statistic is that most traders lose money in the market, you have to ask why. And then you have to ask, am I doing the exact same thing that they're doing? All right? So if you are trying to make a million dollars by next Tuesday, uh, it's unlikely going to be the case. So you have to focus instead of the profits, you have to understand the risk um, and the amount of time that it takes to become successful, not in trading, but in anything, in anything. Like everyone wants to make money um, and everyone wants to be successful and everyone wants to have financial freedom, but you have to ask, what are the people who actually achieve it? What have they done to do it? And then model your life exactly after that. And honestly, ma'am, it's very hard work. Most people don't, they do not want to put in that much work um, for success. And that's why most people, they, 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 they strive after success is because it's, it's an alluring thing to them. Um, it's an alluring thing to everybody, I feel like. And it's just that, that discipline, that consistency, the pitfall, the biggest pitfall would be trying to make money and trying to do it too quickly. So just give yourself time, give yourself patience, realize that Warren Buffett took a while before he became a multi a multimillionaire. Uh, I think he was in his late 30s, early 40s before he even became a millionaire, multimillionaire. So it's like, give yourself a little bit of time and uh, figure out how you can be different than everyone else. Because if you're the exact same as everyone else, then you're gonna get the exact same results that everyone else has. That's pretty powerful, love that. Perfect. And let's see in the chat. Oh, yeah, a few good questions. So Alejandro, uh, would you say security trade stock ETF in the same account that you have your long-term investment? Yeah, so that, that's a good thing. So do you separate yeah, like your long-term stuff then your, as opposed to your short-term short stuff or do you have different accounts for that? Very good question. Yep, yep, very good question. So Mr. Perez, when he was asking about uh, trading in different accounts, in my opinion, uh, again, I'm not a financial advisor. I don't have a license. I don't know if you need, have, need to have a license in order to say what I'm about to say. But for me personally, um, it, it comes down to age. So if you were under the age of 60, uh, I, I do believe that it's important to separate those accounts. Because for me, I trade out of a Roth IRA um, so that when I'm 60, uh, I'm going to be, if not a billionaire, a DECA, uh, a DECA millionaire. And my tax bracket is going to be very high. So I'm going to have this massive tax bracket. So if I'm trading in a Roth IRA and I'm accumulating all these shares of all these companies in a Roth, that, that's post-tax money. So if I pull out that money when I'm you know, 62 or whatever, I'm not going to get taxed on it at all. And that's, I mean, man, that's massive. That's massive. But if you do take the money out now, when you put it in there, you can get penalized in certain in certain tax shelters, like a regular IRA, like a traditional IRA or 401k. 
So yeah, for me personally, I think it is wise to have your long-term positions in a separate account because not only for tax purposes, but also for mental purposes yeah. so that you don't, you, you don't see the trade. You're like, whoa, I'm up 40 grand. This is amazing. So, you know, you don't have that temptation. It's kind of out of sight, out of mind, and you almost forget that you have it. Uh, that to me is one of the biggest benefit beneficial uh, beneficial reasons other than just tax purposes uh, because yeah if you're trading in a smaller account um, you know that's when you're going to do your LLC or your corporation of some kind uh, when you're actually trading for an income so that way you can enjoy the tax benefits because uh, you're going to get short short-term capital gains no matter what and uh, I'll, I'll propose a question to the audience for those who are here uh, if you guys want to throw it in the chat pane so here's a question I have for you guys um, would you rather pay $1 million in taxes or $10 million in taxes? Because I know, I know my answer. Um, I'll let you guys write it in. You tell me uh, what would you rather do? Uh, because for me personally, it's a no-brainer. I would rather pay $10 million in taxes. Because if I'm paying $10 million in taxes, that means that I have so much more money to be paying it with. Right, because if I'm only paying one million, I mean, per the tax law, I'm only made so much money. Right, so if you're if you only if you only pay the one million, um, you're thinking you're thinking about it incorrectly. Because if you have to pay ten million dollars in taxes, <laughs> you made hundreds of millions of dollars that year. Right, if you only paid a million dollars in taxes, I mean, you know, you might have made twenty five million, right, or or thirty million, but you, you're not you're not a hundred millionaire. To pay ten ten million dollars in taxes is a phenomenal phenomenal problem to have. So <laughs> it's it's without question. I'd be I'd be paying the ten. That very good point. Cool. Yeah. And for the people starting out, maybe could you because you talk about the fact that you have to go through hard work and stuff, but you could could you outline some of the things you've had to do to become a profitable trader? Like if someone were to start brand new from scratch, what would they start to go through? Uh, that's a very good question. So I would honestly say the Warren Buffett approach. Um, so for example, if you want to start, if you're going to start anywhere, start with the most simplistic form of trading possible, which is investing into a company that you know. Not like a medical marijuana company that you heard your friend talk about, not some you know penny stock that uh, solves toe cancer. Like a, like a legitimate company, like like a Netflix or an Apple or a Verizon. Like who who do you uh, who do you pay your cell phone bill with? You know, AT and T, Verizon, Sprint, uh, T Mobile. Where do you buy your gas? British Petroleum, Exxon Mobil. So if you have let's say two thousand dollars and you want to start investing, you have a few choices. Um, choice number one is the choice that no one's going to want to do, but that is take that two thousand dollars and go hire someone to give you $200,000 worth of value because you can make that $2,000 back. Yeah. Like if you're like, oh, but I'm gonna miss out on future returns. Future returns on two grand? <laughs> so you're missing out on 200 bucks. Okay, don't, you know, don't worry about it. So that, honestly, step number one is buy some really good books or, or hire a mentor or spend time in some environment with that two grand. If that's all the money that you have to invest in, it's not going to be a life-changing amount of money. You have to build and invest in yourself. I think I think uh, Benjamin Franklin said uh, some, something about investing in yourself because the bank of the mind is the one that will never be robbed, something to that extent. And even though it sounds counterintuitive, people are like, oh, if I got $2,000, you're saying invest in myself, what am I going to receive back? You're going to receive knowledge. You're going to receive the knowledge of what to do with more money. Right, because if you have two thousand dollars, let's say you turn it into three, and you turn three into six, and then six into eighteen, what do you now do with that eighteen thousand? And how do you grow it even faster? If you don't already have that information, that knowledge, and it won't happen regardless. So that would be my first suggestion: is invest in yourself, either books, mentors, tutors, classes, seminars, programs. Spend that money to create the value inside your inside your brain. But if the second, if the first choice just seems like a, a horrendous thing to do even though that's what the minority of people do, uh, the majority of people, I would say, take your money, invest it into something that you understand. And if it's a smaller amount of money, and I would, I'd honestly say a smaller amount of money is really anything less than 20 grand. If you have less than 20 grand, you would put that into something that you truly, at the bottom of your heart, easily and unreconcilably understand. 
So if you drive a Toyota, you love Toyotas, your whole family drives Toyotas, then buy Toyota stock, right? And and buy and go into the chart, look at a good price, um, understand where to buy it and put your money in. And when it goes to a level that you're comfortable selling, sell it, make your return, and then go do it again on another company that you understand, like Home Depot or Sherwin-Williams or Scott miracle Grow or something like that. Yeah, and I really love here that you said the word understand, not believe, because some people might go into what they believe in, like a stock or whatever, or what they really believe in that's going to go higher. But it's not about what you believe, it's about what you understand. And when you understand, you can make better decisions, which is really a big distinction to make. Right. That's, uh, powerful. Love Absolutely. That. I appreciate it, man. Cool. Um, we had a I did, I, 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 yeah, Oliver, go ahead. I, so I was saying, Oliver Charles had asked a question. He says, is it good for Europeans? Um, is it a good idea for European retail traders to trade U.S. markets since we also need to deal with currency exchange? I would say yes, unquestionably, because the currency exchange is something that everyone, every country in the world has to deal with, and you're not special. So if you live in Canada, you live in Europe, I mean, if, if I'm going to buy something in, in England, uh, I know they do the euro, they also do the, the British pound. The British pound is stronger than the dollar. So I'm going to lose money going to England to buy X, Y, Z or the euro right now, dollar for dollar is stronger, you know? So if I think every dollar that I have is a, a dollar, uh, 80 cents, I think in the, for a euro. So I'm, if I go over to Europe, I'm losing 20 cents of my U S dollar. So that is, is it's, a, it's the thing that's going to happen to anybody. So I would say on a macro level, it's, it's good to understand Forex. If you go into a Forex chart and go, yeah, the U.S. dollar is really cheap right now relative to the Canadian dollar or the Japanese yen or the Australian dollar. And so recently, as that was the case, um, I told a lot of people, hey, man, this is a phenomenal time to get some dollars, right? Take your euro or your Australian dollar or your Canadian dollar um, and, uh, and buy, either travel over here to spend time in the States or buy some U.S. stocks. Um, you do want to factor in the dollar exchange for sure so look at a chart before you make any big changes uh, or big transfers but everyone in the in the world should be fi figuring out a way to access the u.s market because it's the biggest market in the, more, the world with the biggest returns and uh it's yeah it's a great question but it's a no-brainer it's just yeah. something that everyone's gonna have to battle with at the same time, I'm wondering, would it be better to focus on the like Europe or the stock market in your country since you know the stocks and you know more what's going on? Or yeah, there's there's pros and there's pros and cons. Right. Um, I think because even other countries, they know they know McDonald's, they know Starbucks, they know Burger King, they know Yum, mm -hmm. like Pizza Hut, KFC, Taco Bell. Uh, I agree that I think it's it, it's integral to keep your money in your in your country to grow your your country's economy. I think that is strong. Uh, it's a strong idea. It's a wise idea. But in the same instance, um, definitely not to sound conceited. But there's a there's a lot of foreign investors who are always going to be investing in the U.S. markets to some degree. Yeah. So it just it really depends um, on on how well you do know those companies. Because like I said, man, at the end of the day, at the end of the day. However much money you're going to make is going to purely come down to how much you know. Simple as that. Uh, and it's, it's just about ulterior way of thinking. Because if you, again, a question to the audience, to so those who are watching, especially those who are watching live, if you receive $10 million in the bank account tomorrow, what would you do? And if your answers are, I would pay off all my debts, I would buy a new car, I would buy a new house, I wouldn't have any debts. If that's the first thing your mind went to. That's the that's what the majority would do, right? That's what everyone else would do. It's not the right answer, right? I mean, if you get ten million dollars, I mean, you got You have to know right now exactly what to do with that money. I mean, what stock are you going to buy? What life insurance settlement are you going to purchase? Uh, what life insurance policy will you buy for yourself? Uh, how will you take an umbrella policy to protect yourself and your family? Um, what real what rental properties will you buy right you you have to know i mean what cities will you buy them in how much are you going to spend what's your cap rate what's your interest rate is going to be you need to know so many details about how it's going to be when you're wealthy otherwise the chances of it happening is very 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 small so if you know 
right, right. I'll, I'll end. I know we're about to wrap up, so I'll end pretty soon. But one of my favorite quotes is, "It's uh, it's not our fear that we are afraid of; it's that we're powerful beyond all measure." So most people are afraid of the unknown, and the unknown to them is not being poor, because they know what they know what that feels like. Like I know what being poor feels like. They know what being poor feels like and living paycheck to paycheck and eating ramen and chicken and uh, sleeping on futons and, you know, not being able, you know, turning off the lights because they're afraid that they might run over their electricity bill, uh, taking two minute showers because they want to stay on their water bill. I get what poor is like. I've been there, you know, in, instead of uh, instead of having Captain Crunch, I ate Sar Sergeant Sugar. Right. So I know what being poor is like. But. You also have to know what being rich is like. And if you have a bad taste in your mind for people who drive nice vehicles, live in nice houses, and you use terms like filthy rich, like since when is rich being, since when is rich being filthy? Like if you have these preconceived notions that rich people are mean, angry, greedy, uh, conceited, and arrogant, you're not going to ever become rich because your brain doesn't want to be conceited, mean, and arrogant. You want to be a beautiful, loving person. But if you also see that there are rich people who are incredibly beautiful, who donate, who are generous. I mean, I just went to the San Diego Zoo yesterday and I saw plaque after plaque after plaque about people who donated their life savings, their, their, all their money when they died to a certain establishment in the zoo for protecting of animals. I mean, that is like we never hear about those things, but those people that happens all the time. So there are rich people. Just as many rich people that are, are mean and arrogant, I know a lot of rich, uh, poor people who are mean and arrogant. Um, just as many rich people are beautiful and loving and incredible people, I know a lot of poor people who are beautiful, loving, and incredible. So it's, it's just what, whatever you see, whatever you focus on. Yeah. So really started to wrap that up, but just simply saying, if you want to become insanely wealthy, you need to know what you're going to do with your money right now, and it, it better not be your average answer. Because if your average answer, money wants to be cooler than that. It doesn't want to hang out with the average person. Money wants to hang out with someone who, who knows exactly how they're going to donate it, to whom they're going to give it, to whom they're going to be responsible for, what charities they're going to, they're going to donate to, what homeless people they're going to be helping. Money wants you to be creative. It wants you to be the best version of yourself. And if all you're going to use money for is to pay off your credit card loans and your student debt, it's not going to be with you because you're not cool. <laughs> Such a good advice. I love that. So link below for your uh, your training room open house next week, I believe. And any other way people can find you if they want to connect with you after? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so yeah, make sure to click on the description box. Uh, click on the uh, re the the link that's in the description box. And if you want to connect with me at any point in time, my email address is Jeremy with two R's, E M Y at Gmail dot com. Um, are also at reallifetrading.com. So Jeremy Newsom at Gmail or Jeremy at reallifetrading.com, both with two R's. Nice. And reallifetrading.com for your website and all you have going on. Perfect. Yes, and you also sir. have a YouTube channel. That's perfect. Oh, man. All the social media stuff, yeah. Just type in Jeremy Newsom. Type in day trading weekly options. Type in uh, reallifetrading.com. Type in desire to trade, baby. You'll find <laughs> me go. and you'll find people helping others around the world. Perfect. Any other last piece of advice you'd like to have for people joining us tonight or today or this morning? Ladies and gentlemen, la last piece of advice I can have is do not settle for average. Do not settle for average. You deserve whatever it is that you want. You got to put that into your brain that you don't have to work. Uh, you don't have to outwork someone else to make more money. You have to become smarter than other people, smarter with your time, smarter with your life and smarter with your habits. So simply believe that you deserve all the things that you want and you'll get it. Awesome. Love that. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you pretty soon. And if you have any com com comment or question for Jeremy, comment below in the comment box after and we'll make sure to answer them. All right. Ciao. Thanks. Thanks everyone.